you mentioned earlier that it was the the twins research that sort of led you to to start thinking about the microbiome and you also just mentioned then that these conditions like obesity and type 2 diabetes really started to to gather pace um you know particularly in the last 30 odd years and i'm interested in this this kind of discussion about genetics epigenetics and the microbiome would i be right that a condition like obesity is highly heritable there are many obesity related genes and that humans for i guess presumably thousands of years have well many many more than that have had these genes and had a susceptibility to storing excessive fat but then it's taken a, a change in the environment in order for, for that to lead to the the overweight or excessive fatness adiposity that we see today yes i mean most studies if you take family studies adoption studies and twin studies you put genetic component to to obesity around 50 or 60 percent so right. the heritable component that is how much of that is explained by your genes is certainly you know is, is over 50 percent in most of these studies so there is a susceptibility to it and there's also there's we did studies showing that where you lay down that fat in your body is also largely genetic so whether you get the beer belly or the big bum or whatever it is, you know, that's um, your genes are sort of deciding where to store that fat in your body, as well as internal fat. So we know that's a big problem. What's called the visceral fat around your organs and your stomach and your liver. Again, there's a, a predisposition to that. And I think if you look at evolutionary wise, um, this was generally beneficial in the past because we used to episodically run out of food and therefore people that were really effective at storing fats did well. And so the idea of the genes was really to maintain this uh, body, body weight at all, at all costs. So you would, uh, they wouldn't, it wouldn't really th make sense to have an upper limit of it. And that's, that's why uh, we're in this problem now. So we've got a set point that cuts in, that stops us burning energy when we get low, but there's no real upper point. And in the past, that hasn't really been a problem uh, and, until we were faced with this overabundance of food, mm -hmm. uh, cheap food that was available, that was super tasty, that made you even more hungry when you ate more of it. Uh, it is combined with an environment where we're perhaps moving you know, less than we, we used to be. So I think, yeah, so the genes that served us well in the past um, are, are not serving us uh, well at the moment. So we, we lay down a lot more fat than, um, than we would have done in the past because we're not, dealt, not having those periods of famine where mm -hmm. it was useful. I think that's the way to see it. But it's, a, it's, you know, it's quite clear now there's a, there's a very good lower set point where our body does everything to keep our body weight at a certain point. And that's why, you know, people on starvation diets just plateau out. Uh, and but at the top, there's no real, there isn't that set point. Mm -hmm. And um, most people will just keep keep going on up. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting though, when you, yeah, about a third of people just seem to have some resistance to getting very overweight. And that's another interesting um, mm -hmm. part of it. That um, even in countries where there's massive obesity, you never find 100% of the population. Um, uh, obese. How many different genes are there that have been kind of identified that r relate to obesity or would predispose someone to gaining excessive fat? Um, several hundred. Several hundred genes. Um, it depends on how your threshold for deciding, you know, what percent. Because the bigger your sample size, the more you can show tiny genes that have a, a minute effect of 0. 0.1. Not one percent, sure. and once you get to a million people, you can start to show these effects, which are very big at a population level, but very trivial at a personal level. Mm -hmm. And I think this is this is the problem. So people say, "Oh, yes, we've discovered, you know, five hundred genes for obesity. Uh, that means we can, you know, understand obesity." But if you put them all together, they maybe only explain one or two percent of mm -hmm. uh, any one individual's. Uh, 
genetic uh, composition so that even if you understood them, you'd only, you wouldn't really be able to predict much about that person. And that's, that's the big difference between, that's why genetics has been disappointing uh, in, in the science of right. uh, chronic diseases because we've found thousands of, of genes, but sticking them all together, they only account for a very small percentage of, uh, of the conditions. So you can't use them as a personalized predictors of things that we thought we were going to. Right, but if, if we're thinking on the individual level, uh, I mean, we all kind of know someone who seems to not have too much trouble at all staying thin and then someone else who is, is seeming to, to try to do all the right things but is, is really struggling. How much of that could be down to genetics versus other factors like the microbiome? I think if you'd asked me five years ago, I'd have said most of that is genetics. <laughs> but... And certainly, you know, just the, the overall maintaining a weight has a, had definitely has a at least fifty percent genetic factor. But knowing that the way we respond to food is not nearly as genetic uh, from our latest research, and that using twins to see when you actually do dynamic studies on twins, how does their body respond to the same food? It's it's much more different than we thought. I think the Environmental component, the microbiome component, could be much more important than we th- than we've believed before. So I'm sure it's a mixture, um, but and and there's definitely some genetic component because we all know families where everybody stays skinny and they can seem to overeat, and others, you know, what it, it's the opposite. But I think there's quite a lot of middle ground and interaction between the genes and the environment and uh, the. Mm-hmm don't depend on genetics. And because we know the microbiome is only very weakly heritable, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, estimates around 5% or something, that's this other whole organ that is outside this genetic control that I think uh, is important. So Mm -hmm. it's going to be a bit of both. I'm not going to go and put a percentage on it because I don't think we know enough about these complex interactions. And individuals might be different and there might be, you know, we're, we can't assume that all the genes are working the same way. And there might be some families where the, these genes really are very strong and others where, you know, it really is the environment and the microbiome that are that's stronger. So I think we have to keep an open mind on that. If someone's listening and thinking, what are these guys talking about, genes and, and obesity, um, are we talking about various genes that could be affecting things like your appetite, um, hormones, so regulation of appetite, or are we talking about genes that regulate your your sort of basal metabolic rate? How would these genes kind of be interacting with this uh, body fatness that we're talking about? Most of the genes that have been found so far, uh, when you look at their function, that have been associated with, with obesity in these massive studies we're talking about, you know, where you get you know, quarter of a million people, and you look at their, you you get you compare their BMI, body mass index, with their genes. Most of them tend to be involved in the brain. Interestingly, mm-hmm. so the genetic control of the brain, which is probably around appetite, satiety, fullness, um, you know, your drive for food, or how quickly you you feel uh, the need to have more food again. Uh, subtle changes there look as if from the from the number of genes that that's uh, more under genetic control than say these other me- metabolic rate mechanisms. Although we should say we we still don't have very good methods of measuring metabolic rate mm-hmm. or understanding how we burn calories. So it could be that we're missing a lot because we don't we can't uh, identify those. But so far, most people see are quite surprised at how much of the, many of these genes are brain function genes rather than uh, adip- adipose function genes. Um, but so, but you know, whether we're scratching the surface or we really have got uh, a full picture, I, I don't think anyone quite knows yet. 